but he studied at the University of Bordeaux and also in, in Chile. And he's made wine in lots of other places, um, in France and in, uh, in the USA and in Argentina. Uh, and um, one thing he's been known for at Erasure is, is a move towards elegance and finesse in the wines, um, away, away from uh, lots of ripe fruit or overripe fruit and oakiness. So, um, uh, the, and this is shown both in the Icon wines and also in the work he's done at Las Pizarras, um, the Burgundy style wines, which are very highly respected in Chile. And he's also got his own little uh, Burgundy style project uh, separately from that. But um, Erasuris has been in business for 150 years. So it's got a lot to, to tell us about the whole history of wine in Chile. So over to France, Francisco to tell us all about it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, hello everyone. Thank you for the invitation. I'm very happy to be here. I, I will try to uh, make a quick introduction of, of, about Chile. Of course, many of you know the country quite well and the wines. And then I have a small presentation. It's a bit corporate from about the Rasuri, so I will just use it as a reference for the for the talking. But uh, please feel free to to ask questions to interrupt me at, at any time. The idea is try to convey so some ideas and some information uh, that is useful for you um, because Chile has been changing a lot uh, really really big changes in the last I don't know maybe 10 7 5 years even 3 years it's 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 moving in different directions and very interesting directions uh, that I think it might be interesting to talk about and not just only the the, the formal presentation. So in terms of Chile, you know, we consider a new world, new world uh, country, wine country, but um, maybe it's a bit unfair this idea because Chile produces wines since the Spanish arrived. Um, we started, they, they brought the Mission, you know, the, the, the Pais uh, uh, variety. But Chile uh, produced wine since Chile is Chile, and and the wine is part of the culture and the food. Uh, uh, it's part of the table of the Chilean tables for for forever. Um, and the thing is that we didn't export wine. All the production, which was quite big, imagine that the the consumption at some time. Uh, per capita in Chile per year uh, was as high as 70 liters per person uh, per year, which is, is quite, quite big. Uh, today, we're roughly 15 or 14 liters. Um, but it's, it's a country that, as I said, produced wine for... for um, can, can you... Somebody... No, it's okay, because I see some... Uh, okay. I, I will share the the screen later, and and um, so so the, the we didn't export as I said, and this started to happen in the end of the 80s, beginning of the 90s, uh, and we we uh, started to send our wines overseas. But the wines in Chile uh, was mainly Pais in the beginning uh, until the middle of the 19th century, when some wealthy people from from the mining. Uh, like Don Maximiano, which is the founder of Vigna Rasuris, decided to uh, import, let's say, quality varieties, no? because Pais is a, is a more rustic, simple variety that grows well in dry farming and, and big production, was used to produce more volume wines. You can do some very interesting things with Pais, but old Pais, etc., that would be another conversation. But in the middle of the 19th century, some people uh, established uh, wineries more modern. They went to France and brought, uh, let's say, quality varieties from Bordeaux, no? Cabernet. Uh, this is when we brought Carmener without knowing. Um, and you know the story that we thought it was Merlot, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, many wineries that the old and classic wineries that you know, like uh, Cusino Magul, Santa Rita, uh, Conchitoro, Erasuris, 
uh, were founded and established. Uh, I will I will uh, quickly uh, I'll try to share the the screen here um, to show you. Uh, let me see if I can I can. Uh, so this 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 is a small presentation. Can you see? Can can you see the the yeah? Okay. So well, this is this is the man, uh, Maximiano Rasuris. Uh, the, 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 he established and, and uh, he founded the winery in 1870. Uh, he was a, a congressman. He was a, a person that all the Rasuris family has been very important in the in the Chilean. Uh, history, you know, like uh, there's presidents of the family, archbishops, etc. Maximiano Rossi was a, a businessman and, a, and a, a political man and involved in many things. Uh, and he had also this passion of, and he had land uh, and, and in, on wine. Uh, most of the wineries, as you know, in Chile at the time were established uh, in the outskirts of Santiago in Maipo Valley, you know, near Santiago, the, the people had these this haciendas and land and, and established the, the wineries there. Uh, but in the case of Don Maximiano, he had uh, land in Aconcagua, uh, not in Maipo, and, and he was looking for the perfect place to produce, uh, at the time, most of the production was red, right? Uh, to produce red varieties in, in a place that is a slightly warmer and drier than Maipo. So this is Aconcagua Valley, a bit north of Santiago. Only 80 kilometers, today one hour and a half driving, but at the time way long, longer, no? So he was a bit of a pioneer in that sense. He, uh, my uh, Aconcagua Valley inland, where the winery established, is uh, is a, is a bit drier than 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 Maipo. All the the rain was con is concentrated in in winter, uh, and it's it's slightly hotter. Today things have changed. Of course, climate change uh, uh, happen everywhere, uh, but it's, it was a very safe place and good place, good terroir soil to produce red red wines. In the in the in the beginning, no. So this is a, an actual old picture of of how it looked at at the time. Rasuri's winery in 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 Aconcagua, uh, and uh, the, since the winery is a, uh, is a family-owned winery, it's a five five generation six already because the daughters of Eduardo. Uh, it's it's a good blend or, or a mix of tradition, you know, history, with innovation, uh, because as it's a, it's a family winery, Eduardo Chávez, the actual owner, he's, he's very involved, you all, probably you all know him, and, and he's very involved in, in uh, promoting Chile, not only Rasuris, and trying to improve the image of, of Chile and the quality of Chilean wines, etc. So he travels like crazy and, and he he really uh, uh, work for for the Chilean image. We have some milestones here when the winery was established, uh, when um, Eduardo's father took over uh, Alfonso Chadwick, and, and here we have 1983, important date because this is when a uh, very young Eduardo Chadwick took over uh, the reigns of, uh, of uh, Rasuris, and since, since then he's been working for all this, this more than 30 years, on developing the quality and the terroir and, and, and the Rasuri's uh, winery. Uh, and then, well, we had this uh, Berlin tasting event that Eduardo created, created a, a bit out of frustration of the lack of recognition at the time of the Chilean wines, trying to, to show that the icon or the high-end wines uh, uh, were as uh, world-class world wines and could be in the company of the, of the big wines of the world with a very astonishing results and he repeat this tastings, Berlin tasting for 10 years with always a very good results from our um, iconic wines like the Maximiano, Seña and Vinedo Chávez. And then we, uh, in 2010, we uh, built uh, the icon fully dedicate, dedicated winery for our iconic wines 
very sustainable winery, very, lots of natural light, all gravity flow, and this is where we, where we make our our uh, top wine. So very quickly, that's um, the path of of Erasuris. Aconcagua carries the name of of the Mount Aconcagua, that uh, the, the valley, you know, that is the the highest peak of the uh, southern hemisphere, and the the the, the valley. The snow from the Andes goes to the to the Pacific, so this is the, the river Aconcagua also, Aconcagua Valley because of the river Aconcagua, and and the river shape the the valley uh, through the through the ocean and create the soils around, etc. This is how it works in Chile, the, what we call transversal valleys that the, the river create these valleys that goes from east uh, to west. Uh, I have this picture here that is very in, um, makes simple to understand Chile how it how it how it works. Chile produced wine traditionally from Aconcagua, traditionally historically from Aconcagua, from uh, uh, let's say Rasuris Aconcagua um, to Maule. Uh, that that was the traditional area in Chile producing wine. That's roughly 500 600 kilometer long. Um, it mainly of the most of the production in the central part of this is central part of Chile, and Chile, you know, have the Pacific. The, uh, then we have a little piece uh, in the coast, and that is very cold. And the, because the, the the influence of the breezes from the Pacific because of the Humber Current, that is cold. Uh, and then we have a, a coastal range that prevent and stop the direct influence of the of the cool cool climate or cool breezes from the Pacific, and then you have a uh, what we call entre cordillera or a, or a, a valley in between uh, the 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 ranges, which is the coastal and the Andes range, and this is the central area, uh, central valley that we call, um, and then again you you start having the the Andes with the cool conditions in altitude, but Chile produced. Uh, traditionally from Aconcagua to Maule, and most of the production, all the production was in the, this central part between the coastal and the Andes range. And this area is rather warm because it's protected from the cool influence from the sea by the coastal range. So when Chile wanted to produce, uh, and even the, the white was produced there, so it wasn't the best, the best quality because it was a bit too, too hot. When Chile started to export and wanted to improve the quality of the cool climate varieties, we realized that we didn't have the right the right places to produce them. Sauvignon, Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, because it was too hot. And this is when, uh, if I might find one here, this is when we decided to start developing other uh, cool climate areas, and probably you know that the one of the first one was Casablanca, right near the Pacific. In the case of Erasuris, you can see the, this narrow green uh, valley, you know, from, from this is Aconcagua, a bit north of Santiago. The, the red spots are all the vineyards that we have inland. Max, the, the winery is established and founded founded and established in what we call today Max 1. This is where the, the winery is located. And inland here, all the Maxes that carry the name of the founder are rather hot, with differences, of course. Max 5, for instance, is near the river, uh, and it's, a, it's an alluvial soil, it's a terrace, where I can produce beautiful, beautiful Cabernet in a gravel soil, very similar climate to Maipo, Alto Maipo. Whereas Max 1 or Max 2 are more in Piedmont uh, with soils that are um, and, and with more exposure, exposure facing north. So completely different style. Uh, their Carmenel works very well, Petit Verdot, we have a bit, and the Cabernet is a bit more structure, more power, um, whereas Max 5, for instance, is more finished. So we have a big diversity of soils microclimates because of exposure, etc. Uh, and also uh, the macroclimate, which is hot in, inland. For instance, Max 7, that you can see there near San Felipe, that's our hottest spot. And that is completely 
inland uh, receive no influence of the cool breezes that still go through the river, zero, and it's very, very hot. And this is where, where we have planted, for instance, some Mediterranean varieties like uh, Murvedra and Grenache and others. So, and, and, and in 2005, we had land in Casablanca, but we wanted also to develop uh, the whole valley, Aconcagua, that was Eduardo's idea. And so we decided to develop uh, Aconcagua Costa Vineyard, which is only 10 kilometers from the ocean, to produce uh, our cool climate uh, wines, uh, Pinot, Sauvignon, and Chardonnay. The, the main goal in the beginning was to find a cool place, cool valley, for mainly Sauvignon uh, at the time. This is in, in the early 2000. We developed the property in 2004, 2005. But then we realized that the place had a very, very good potential because of the soil. It's a schist soil that I will show you quickly uh, to produce Pinot and Chardonnay and also Syrah, cool climate Syrah. So at the end today, the property is like half Sauvignon Blanc in the coolest spots and the other uh, part is Pinot, Chardonnay, and a little bit of Syrah. So Erasuris, as you can see, we cover the whole valley. It, this is rare to have a winery that in one valley, because this is a long valley that goes from the coast to inland, we can produce from Sauvignon Blanc to Grenache. Uh, of course, with Cabernet and classical Bordeaux varieties in, in the central area. Um, so this is the, the icon, iconic winery that was built in 2009. Um, and this is the, we call, we have divided a little bit the, the, the Aconcagua in, in, in three areas, you know, Alto, meaning that more inland uh, where we have the, the, the Bordeaux varieties and, and some Mediterraneans. Um, we have, as I explained already, different kind of soils, but uh, here you have an image of of the gravel soil that we have in Max 5 near the, near the river, which is really beautiful, very good drainage, is flat, so the, the, there's not that much exposure. The vines are, are very old, and we can produce Cabernet that is really, really nice, similar to what we, you can have in, in Alto Maipo. Um, let me see. Then we have, uh, this is the, well, this is the, the old facility, you know, the, the old winery. Uh, if you visit, you will see that. Then we have Entre Cordillera, which is like the middle of the valley, where we also have vineyards that are a bit cooler because they're closer to the Pacific. Um, and the soils are also, we can have different kind of soils. This is more colluvial. You can see that the rocks are not round. These are more the, the material from the erosion of the foothills. And here we can produce very good Petit Verdot, some uh, Carmener, um, etc. But it's a bit more clay, so the Cabernet is a bit more powerful and structured, not that much finesse like in Max 5, so different style. Um, and then we have a Costa, right, that I was just explaining, that was devel uh, developed in 2005, and uh, where we have a direct influence of the cool breezes from the, from the Pacific. Uh, only 10, the, the whole property is four kilometer wide, uh, long. Uh, so the, the, the part that is closer to the, to the ocean, that is only 10 kilometers from the Pacific, we have planted mainly with Sauvignon. In the middle, uh, it's very hilly. In the middle part, we plant uh, Pinot and Chardonnay mainly facing south, so cooler, cool, cool uh, uh, exposure. And a bit more inland, we have some more um, Chardonnay and Syrah. And the Syrah is facing north, so it's a bit uh, warmer. And this is a, an image of the soil that we have. This is the soil here that was a big, big, good surprise for us. It's a metamorphic rock. Metamorphic rock is uh, the origin could be either volcanic uh, or um, plutonic, so igneous from magma, from the, the, the deep, any of those that goes into a lot of pressure and temperature for very, very long, and it changed a little bit the shape, that's why metamorphic, and it could be 
more like um, horizontal layers that this, and depending on the mineralogy, is what you probably know as a slate. So, so more like, uh, and, and, and or could be um, a schist that is a, a, a slightly different composition and the crack, the, 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 the pressure and the, the layers are a bit more vertical usually. But anyway, the, the, the soil, uh, this, this rock is, is of course uh, cracked and, and weathered, so the, the roots can go through, but we have a, and we have a very good drainage, but it also lends some good uh, minerals to the plant. And I think that always the, 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 the good and the best wines in the world uh, have a rock there. It's the, the, the just soil, you know, just dirt. Uh, the, 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 the vine is very lazy and they just develop uh, growth and, 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 and vigor and, and fruit. Uh, but usually in, in, the, in the big wines of the world, you have an interaction with the rock that changes a little bit the drainage and moderate the vigor. Etc. cetera. Uh, in here, we have wines that are very, very, let's say more austere and restrained, more very linear and, and, and vertical wines, uh, more, more old world in the style. You know? Chardonnay, I, I love it because, well, we get a very nice acidity because it's close to the ocean, it's cold, but, but the style of the wines are not the, the opulence and, and, and tropical and big and sweet, are more uh, dry and austere which I really like. So it's been a very good success for us. The wines that, that, that Liz mentioned with Pizarras, for instance, that we developed in, in, in the last uh, years. This is an image of, of Aconcao Costa that you can see is quite hilly. So we have different exposures in West, the East, the different clones and etc. So it gives me a lot of vers versatility and diversity to, to play in, uh, with the wines, etc. For those that know know the rasuri is a bit less, this is the the, the, the the pyramid of product the portfolio. In the top we have our, our icons. Some are very classic and all like uh, uh, Don Maximiano, which is our oldest wine from all vines uh, Cabernet base uh, that carries the name of the founder. Then we have Villa, which is a like a, let's say second wine like in the the do the, the, the French in Bordeaux, uh, called Villa, Villa Don Maximiano. La Cumbre, which is our top um, iconic Syrah. Errazuris is the first winery to introduce Syrah in Chile in 93. Eduardo brought cuttings from, from Ron when Chile didn't produce. Uh, and this is an, um, an, an homage to, to that innovation side. Cai is our uh, Carmener icon wine. And then you have the three Pizarra wines uh, that come from the coast with, with uh, very, very good results. The concept that I tried to develop was very uh, burgundy in the approach. We did a survey for many years to understand the terroir and to understand what to try to make a wine of origin, uh, not just a blend any, every year different and uh, fantasy name, but uh, uh, try to un identify in the, in the vineyard out of the 60 hectares of Pinot or the 50 hectares of Char uh, Chardonnay, w w those parcels that uh, represent our Grand Cru. So Pizarras come from only two parcels in Chardonnay and three parcels of Pinot that provide what we consider to be, in Chile we don't have such a uh, appellation system, but what we consider to be the Grand Cru of the property in these varieties, which is a very um, easy way to explain from from the French side, you know, but for, for, for Chile it was very inno innovative to produce a wine that was coming always from the same place that we consider the highest quality and, and style. And then we have the specialty range with Ag the Aconcao Costa wines and, and others. Max that are our reserva, similar reserva wines that are a bit more commercial, but very important with Cabernet and, and Pinot and others. And then the state range that is our uh, entry uh, range. Um, let me see. So I think I don't know. Am, am I doing too fast? To, to or are we? I think we're right on the time. Uh, uh, yeah, we're. Yeah, you've got a few more minutes if you wish, Francisco. Go ahead. Or 
Okay, I'm, I'm just about to fit uh, here. Well, this is the Maximiano that I already explained instead of using the slides. The Villa, that is a more new product that uh, we started in 2016, that we have to have, a, let's say, like a second wine, but, but with its own personality. So it's, a, it's not just a copy or the, with the, or the leftovers of the Max. I wanted to give a personality of its own. So we, it, in, it includes some Mediterranean varieties in the blend. So it's like 70% Bordeaux, 30% Mediterranean varieties. And, and it's a wine that is, is really appealing uh, for the price, very, very interesting with aging potential, et cetera. And we, the second production is 17. Kai that I explained, Kai means, means plant in native language. And it comes from our oldest, vineyards of, of Carmenel, uh, La Cumbre already I explained, and Pizarra that we started with uh, Pinot and Chardonnay. Uh, the first Pizarras were made in 2004, uh, sorry, 2014, um, and, and the production it's very limited and it always be because I, as I explained, I, I contact uh, Francois Vanier Petit, a, a geologist, from, geologist from Burgundy, and we, we try to identify the soil, the geology, the exposure, the, the, and tasting, of course, to identify the parcels that produce the most delicate, elegant wines. And so it's only three hectares of Chardonnay uh, and, and five hectares of Pinot, so we can produce up to 1,000 cases or so. Um, and it's a wine that is allocated and is, is sold out every year and, and it shows that if you have a good concept and uh, origin wine, etc., you can produce really wines that are high-end quality and that you can sell at a high price. Chardonnay from Chile at, at uh, 60 dollars $70 the bottle is not that common and it's, it, it's gone all the time. We could sell three times more. Pinot is a bit more expensive, so it's a bit uh, not, not the same as Chardonnay, but works very well. And then in 2017, we produced the Syrah, that, uh, that is also very limited because it comes from, from this particular parcel. Uh, I think that, well, specialty uh, range, more innovative, Max, I explained, and the state. So th this is a very, very quickly <laughs> overview. We could we could talk for, for for long because Chile today. I was explaining that traditional production area was from 500 kilometer long from Aconcagua to Maule, but today Chile is 1,200 kilometer long production area from the desert uh, to to south to to really deep south. Uh, so we have been developing uh, new areas, new terroirs, moving south that have dry farming to the coast, to the north, um, and more and more uh, small producers that uh, make a big difference because they are very attached to one particular place. Uh, difficult for small producers because we're far and we have to export, uh, etc. But they started to change many, many ways of of how Chile produce uh, an, an approach uh, wine that for some time was very market driven in a way when we had this explosion of in the beginning of the of the 90s of uh, ex exporting wine uh, but maybe we we pay a lot of attention to to the market uh, demand uh, and less of understanding the places and and the terroir and trying to offer something that is more origin driven uh, and that well we could we could we could talk for hours about that so well okay francisco thank you very much there are a few questions here and what i'll do is i'll try and unmute the people and ask them to get them to ask their questions there's richard lane i think he you may have already covered this but richard would you like to ask your question yeah thank thank you and hi um, francisco lovely presentation Hello, you, hi you you have touched on it since i since i um wrote the question a few minutes ago. I just wondered if you could give a little more insight into Carmen Air, which of course we all love because we, it's so specific um, mm. to, to, to Chile. 
but also because I think common area is quite a difficult variety uh, because it can be easily leafy and underripe, but it can become overripe and jammy um, <laughs> too. Okay. Yeah. So I just wondered, you know, what's your view on, on common air, and particularly in relation to what you're describing about terroir uh, in, in your sure. vineyards? Do you, th do you think com common air has to be treated very carefully because it's a bit tricky? Well, we, we, uh, it's a very good question because I think we have learned a lot about Carmen Air. Uh, you know that it was uh, mixed with Merlot and, and we realized that it was a late, we, we call it late Merlot. We thought it was a strain of Merlot, a different, uh, because we realized that it was um, uh, uh, ripening a bit later than Merlot. But when we realized it was a different, a different variety in 94, we didn't really know a lot about this variety. There was there was no other reference because France didn't have any more, etc. And what I have learned, at least from my side, and I think many other people too, is that it's a variety that where you have to be very very patient. Uh, Carmener is a variety that naturally is vigorous, naturally has more pyrazine, more than Cabernet, more than Cab Franc, etc. And you need you need to uh, plant it, of course, in the right place. It's, it's, a, it's a variety that we thought it needed like hot, but it's not true. It needs long areas where you can have a long ripening period. So not early rain or not too, not too cold too early. You know, you, you have to give a, a slightly longer time for ripening, but not necessarily super hot. Um, but with time, uh, it starts to balance uh, the the bigger and, and 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 the canopy and the production uh, started to go down and and the pyrazine also naturally started to go down because it, it's like it tends to be uh, is young uh, for longer and with more pyrazine etc. If you plant it in the right place, like I said, warm enough and and where you have you can have a long hang a long hanging growing season. Yeah. yeah. Um, and as the vines get old, you start to naturally having uh, less pyrazine, less vigor, less green character. Because the problem is when you, the Carmenet has a low pH in general, uh, high pH in general, low acidity, or, or lower compared with Petit Verdot or others. So when, when you have a young vine uh, and you try to get rid of the green, what did we do? We leaf plug. We uh, push the the peaking the harvest to the to the limit. We usually we did it in in middle of May in the past, which is crazy. Wow! <laughs> but you lose a lot of acidity. You lose more and more more acidity. If it's planted in the in the in the slightly hot area, you will have a lot of sugar through this very very long hang, um, and you will have a steel because you leave plaque. Uh, green character, but not like a, a pure green, but you will have like a, like a, what I call cooked vegetal. And at the end, you still have the green in, in a yeah. more cooked, cooked way, you know, and you have very little acidity. Uh, so it's the worst scenario for me when you have this cooked vegetal characteristic, which the fruit is a bit overripe, the vegetal is, is cooked, but it's there. Uh, you lose all the acidity, so the, the wine is a bit flowy, or you have to correct, uh, and the color will evolve fast, and the wine will evolve fast, fast, etc. So it's a variety that, if you want to produce, and you can produce very, very nice wines because the tannins are soft. The, if once the, the green uh, uh, period goes away, you can you can have nice spiciness. Is lots of red fruit. Um, it's, a, it's a very appealing and interesting uh, wine, but you have to wait that that happen a bit nor, uh, naturally. And I today prefer no zero leaf plugging. I don't want to explore, expose the fruit uh, because it will, I will lose color, acidity, uh, the fruit will dehydrate, etc., etc. The, the, the fruit will uh, thicken the skins so you get more tanning, not very nice. Uh, and you lose color. Uh, I prefer to have a, a, a bit more honest greenness, but with more fresh and more fruit 
and more acidity, etc. Not that I will pick in March, no, but I might pick in April. Have a little bit of the spicy and the herbal character that is natural to Carmener, but saving the good side, which is this soft tanning, nice color, very intense color, more acidity, so the wine will age better, etc., etc. Uh, once you, you, you get in this in your head, you realize that for, for making iconic, high quality Carmener, you need all vines for sure. You have to be patient more than 10, 15 years. And in the meantime, you is not necessarily the solution, not necessarily to pick super, super late because I think that doesn't make it uh, attractive anyway. Sorry for the long answer. <laughs> that's a great answer. Thank you. Old vines and old winemakers, maybe. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Francisco. I think we're moving over to Nick Room now, who's moving on to Syrah. <laughs> Hello. Okay. Hello, Francisco. Thank you for Thank that you. excellent presentation. I love the Thank slides you. as well. Uh, so premium and um, well done. Um, just Thank wanted to know more about um, Chilean Syrah, because I remember yeah. in my time buying Syrah, it wasn't the easiest sell to customers. Um, mm. And there was a debate too about whether the Chileans were going to call it with the old world Syrah or the new uh -huh. world Shiraz. I just wonder where that debate's taken us and um, if you see Syrah as still a potential opportunity in worldwide trade. Well, well, I, I love Syrah, more Ron style than other, but, but, uh, but I, think, I think it has a, you can find today very, very beautiful, attractive Syrah. It depends on the style you prefer, of course, mm -hmm. but uh, you can produce inland in hotter areas Syrahs that are more lush and, and big and ripe, or you can produce uh, Syrahs that are more cool climate, a bit more spicy, more acidity, less alcohol. So you have a, a diversity of, of, of Syrahs in Chile. Uh, some of them are, are really, really interesting with personality, etc. But unfortunately, how to say, one producer that is focused 100% in Syrah is Paul Cura, you know, Sven Brookfeld. Um, but th there's no, Syrah is in Chile to, in general, Matetic also makes a nice, a very good Syrah, it's part of the, important of the portfolio, etc. But but most of the, the, the Syrah in Chile is, is, uh, is an another alternative, you know, so, and we haven't made maybe all the efforts because commercial has been tough uh, to, 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 to sell and to promote the Syrah, but you can find some, some really good things. And if you go to rather cool areas, you can have uh, Syrahs that are very appealing and, and, and interesting. But I think we haven't done all the effort because Chile, one good thing, which is the diversity that we have from Chile, today you can have nice Chardonnay, nice Pinot is improving a lot. You have the Cabernet, you have the the, the, the Carignan, the País, the, the blah, 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 Syrah. But it, sometimes we lack also some focus in some varieties. You know, we, we're very well known for Bordeaux varieties in the beginning. Uh, then we have uh, done some efforts, good ones in, in, in some Burgundy like Chardonnay, Sauvignon Blanc also. Uh, but well, we haven't done it in Merlot, for instance, at all. Uh, then some Mediterranean and, and Spanish varieties that are very interesting because we have old vines in Maule. But see that we haven't maybe uh, focused that that much. But uh, there's some good good potential there. Yeah, sure. Perhaps the customers don't quite understand Chile and Syrah because they're offered many opportunities and they can't home in on particular style, uh, whereas they know what they can get when they buy Australian Shiraz or they know what they get when they buy a bottle of Rhone. Um, the Absolutely. other question was around Villa. Um, I hadn't come across that before. It was interesting to hear you say. Is that something which Hatch import? Yeah, 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 absolutely. It's, 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 it just started. Uh, yeah. It's a new wine. Yeah, that, that's why. But yeah, yeah. We, Do you produce a fair amount of it? Uh, it's not a big, no, it's like, 2,000 cases today, mm -hmm. but there's a good potential of, of growing because we have 
uh, more and more old, old vineyards of, of Malbec, uh, not only Cabernet, because Cabernet, we lack Cabernet. We, we, you always think Chile, oh, Cabernet, but to make really, really good Cabernet is not that easy. There's no everywhere. So we always lack Cabernet for, for Seña, for the Max. And so here I wanted to, to have more like a blend because we have very, very good vineyards of, of Malbec, of Petit Verdot, uh, of Cap Franc, uh, even Carmener, uh, and a few um, Murvedre, and a few um, uh, Mediterranean varieties. Thank so you. We, can, we can grow, and it's a, it's a very interesting wine. I really like it for, for the price, very, very more, more approachable and affordable, yeah. Thank you. Thank You're you. welcome. I think, Liz, you were sort of following on with the Mediterranean varieties there. Yes, um, I was uh, interested to hear you mention that there are Mediterranean varieties um, and I'd be interested to hear what you think the potential of them is, uh, it, both at Erasmus and um, generally for Chile, particularly as the climate's getting warmer. Yeah, well, we, we have, a, we have a, a, a diversity of climate and the rice that is, is, is really huge, that we haven't explored a lot. For instance, one of the first to produce in this metamorphic schist rock is Rasuris and now Miguel Torres in Paredones. But there's a really a, an opportunity of, of, of doing things different and different climates. And, and, and Mediterranean varieties, uh, for instance, what we have in, in Aconcagua, are really really beautiful. We have we can produce beautiful Grenache and we and, and also well Syrah and and Murvedre, really nice color, nice tannins. Um, so I think there's a good potential there, but at some point we need to also focus. So so it's 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 like we're, we're discovering and and developing many things. Uh, some people have produced also in the south, in all vines, but it's a, it's an, it's a product and uh, varieties that have good, really good potential and, and, and a lot of personality. So, yeah, I think, uh, yeah. Be interesting to see, thank you. Welcome. Is, is climate change a sort of one of the major things that's affecting you, Francisco? Is that a major challenge for you or not really? No, no, yes, it is. For you to have an idea, Santiago in 2019, Santiago, I mean in Maipo, we got like 80 millimeters of, of, of rain through the year, which is nothing. I mean, that really, normally Santiago, you get a bit above 300, you know. When I was a kid, it was 400. Um, so so it's, it's something that climate change, you can see, not necessarily that the, it, it goes to an absolute desert, but it goes to extremes. Some year you can have very, very little, some year you can have a lot of everything. Like for instance, I don't know if you know, but in 16, 2016 in Chile, it was a very long ripening, very cool vintage, super long, low alcohol, and it, it looks like it never gonna reach uh, maturity. Uh, especially for the big production, big crop and fertile soils. Uh, and, and we picked, uh, I picked everything in the middle of April uh, in Maipo, for instance, which uh, I normally pick today in the middle of March for Vineyard Chadwick, for instance. So one month difference in, in aiming to a, a, a uh, an elegant style, uh, 13 alcohol, 13 and a half. But I, I wait uh, uh, the, the Vigneault Chadwick 16 is 13 alcohol and picked in the middle of April, where 17, super hot, super early, su low crop, uh, is 13.5, picked in the middle of March. So, so really different. And in, in 16, we had this huge rain in the middle of April with more than 100 millimeters in two, in two days. So it's Climate change is a, is a reality, and overall we see that the north is getting a bit drier. But this year we have had a beautiful rains uh, in winter. Now we're very happy, but we went through many years of drought. Uh, 
So, so south also is an alternative because you can drive far because you have 1,000 millimeters, but for varieties that are more cool climate, you cannot plant Cabernet. So yeah, it's, it's, it's something that has forced us to, to invest in, 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 in water reservoirs and, and, et cetera, and, and pay more attention to irrigation management. I will connect the, this or I will lose you, sorry. about to lose Francisco. No. Okay. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Big, big thing, big thing. Okay. I, I'm not sure there's any other questions there. I don't know if you, anybody else wants to ask any more questions to Francisco um, or whether there's anything else that you wish you'd like to share with us, Francisco. Um, I, I mean, are you looking at other grape varieties growing in climate change or different locations or? Well, in general, we have water because we, we still have rain in winter and we have snow that today, if you could see, it's beautiful snow. In the, but but uh, we didn't do all the investments that we needed, we needed to do. Um, so, so I think we need to, to, to make sure to make dams, etc., cetera, to, to, to keep the water. Uh, and then... Um, so, so uh, Chile uh, will will explore also different areas. As I said, the south is is becoming more and more important, but we still need the, the central area to produce uh, the more traditional varieties. But uh, I think the, the the wineries and the producers are taking the measures to 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 uh, face these these challenges. For sure, but uh, Chile is, uh, is is change have changed in a lot in many aspects in the last uh, ten years. Plant material improve uh, the 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 terroirs. Um, many things that we have uh, done in the beginning. Chile was more like climate, you know, the focus, the right climate. Then it was uh, soil that we didn't pay attention a lot in the beginning. And now it's a more holistic, whole, whole uh, approach of the whole terroir, you know? Um, the, the, everything. In the beginning, beginning was technology. You know, when Chile started to exp export, we didn't have stainless steel tank, uh, uh, cool, cool, uh, enough uh, cooling system, etc. So it was technology, then climate, then soil and then the whole the whole the whole thing you know and then commercially also i think there's many things to 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 improve chile with this sort of pyramid that we we have sometimes the big winer especially is very difficult because what importer do you use if you're a pyramid you want to sell icon wines for that you need a specialist that sells little volume in restaurants and, and good uh, wine shops or you want to sell volume in supermarkets, it is, and if you are the same winery, and you you want your importer if it's high end sell high end wine, but also you start asking to sell a lot of variety, varietal wine, or the other way around. So we 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 have many things to address and to learn. In the beginning, when Chile started to export uh, like crazy in the 90s, we were very happy, of course, but it was a boom. And it was faced like any business, you know, like uh, if you make shoes and you have a lot of demand, you make, you buy more leather and you make more shoes. But uh, wine, wine is, doesn't work like that at all. The mistakes you may, you may, you make today, you pay for it for 20 years. And you, 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 uh, you can have a, a business that uh, was born dead from day one, if you make a mistake, because the, 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 the investments in vineyards are huge. And you cannot correct that. Once you made a mistake, uh, you're done. And, and Chile doesn't have any uh, state control. So, because we're very uh, neoliberal and super free for everything, which is good in the base, but it's not good if you plant Carmener in Casablanca, like we did, and the poor producer want to sell that at all costs because he spent a lot of money on it and but that damaged the market because the wine is green 
and he will take 10 years to realize and accept the loss and uh, change it into another thing. So we could talk hours about this, but uh, Chile is changing in the right way, uh, but it takes time um because the critic and the people that know the country they understand the the path and what we've done and wh how the the qualities improve but we still have the image of of good but cheap and so we have to convince the produce the consumer now that they have they can go safely to try wines terroir or origin wines, uh, if you look for, and, and that we produce today. But it is, it's long. Uh, you have to have patience, and Chileans, we don't have much patience. Yeah, sure, <laughs> sure, sure. I think Nick was just going to ask about, are you using any tinajas? Tinajas? Go ahead, Nick. <laughs> if I've uh, no, in, for just us, me. we have different different bats that we use. Fudre, for instance, I use more for, for icons. 2,500 liters foodres. We use uh, some uh, concrete eggs in wines that I want to keep as it is, you know, and, and a little bit of lease uh, convection, etc. But uh, to have a bit more reduction uh, environment, and uh, we have uh, open tops for Pinot and Syrah. We have um, concrete tanks for fermenting. We have we have many not tinajas, but different a lot of different. I use more and more big. Bar, big volume barrels for, for instance, Chardonnay and Pinot. They're more like 400 liters instead of to do weight. Mm -hmm. So we have we have today a big bad options uh, alternatives uh, in, in in yeah containers. Let's so to say. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Francisco. You're welcome. <laughs> So when? Okay, do you want to say the last few words, Liz? Yes, well, a very, very big thank you, Francisco. This has been absolutely fascinating. And as you could say, we could talk for hours about uh, a number of the subjects you've raised. I'm ashamed uh, that we are limited, but uh, it's, it's been revealing um, the pictures of the valley, uh, ones I haven't seen before and are really impressive. Uh, and uh, it, it gives a place to the wines, which I think is obviously important for your wines and it's helpful for us. And uh, your overview as well has been really interesting. So thank you very, very much indeed. And uh, we'll look forward perhaps to a repeat uh, in a while's time so we can see uh, the progress that's obviously ongoing. Thank you very much indeed. Pleasure. Thank you. My, my pleasure and thank you for um joining and for the support and for the interest my my pleasure thank you